So, good afternoon. Glad to see so many people at the last, well, second to last session of the day. Of course, we've got the closing session here in just a little bit. I'm Aaron Poffenberger, and this is uh, the talk that I've uh, called Road Warrior Disaster Recovery. Uh, secure, synchronized, and backed up. A little bit about me, I'm a software developer. I um, work um, for various companies writing usually security software and hopefully secure security <coughs> software. I've been using OpenBSD since about 3.2 and then like probably everybody who owns a computer, I'm somewhat of a backup operator. A little bit about this talk, kind of an overview of what we're going to be talking about right there. Let's talk first about the motivation. Why, why do this talk? Well, it started uh, about four years ago. I was at uh, the office. I had this really great script. We were talking about sys upgrades. So I had um, you know, v0.1 of my own version of that, which would download install.fs and then dd it to a thumb drive. But like all good scripts, it started out really um, quickly written and somebody hard coded which device to DD to. So it was SD2. Yeah, everybody knows where this is going, right? <laughs> and you may laugh, please do. So um, I had rebooted the system and forgot there was an SD card slot. And so my FDE didn't appear on SD1, it appeared on SD2. And so when I uh, put the thumb drive in, it appeared on SD3. And DD then proceeded to overwrite uh, the root partition. And I just barely hit enter when I realized, <laughs> no, 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 stop, control C, control C. You know, and so it overwrote part of the root partition. I document all this in a blog post that you can get from the uh, slides later. But you know, the first um, thought when you see something like that is you panic, right? But then I thought to myself, OK, hang on a second, hang on a second. This is OpenBSD. It keeps a copy of the disk label in var backup. All I've got to do is get the disk label. And all of a sudden, the kernel panicked. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> and so here I am. I'm stuck. And I'm thinking, OK, OK. Um, I back up at home. I've got a copy of the disk label at the house once again. I'm, I'm in good shape. Um, so somewhere, I'm not sure how I was able to get to the, the server in question, but I, I check. And somebody had blown away that entire backup partition most recently. And so I'm looking at this. I'm like, oh, man, I am totally stuffed. But then I remembered, oh, hang on a second, hang on a second. Isn't there an FF uh, or yeah, scan FFS um, tool? It'll find this stuff for me. And so long story short, after a lot of work, I found all of the partitions. Thank God OpenBSD still partitions. We're not Linux. We don't have a monolithic partition. So I found all the partitions. I recovered all of the data except for a few things in slash etc, which was just well gone. Install.fs lays it about 250 megabytes worth of data down, and it got a big chunk of it down. So, um, so that made me realize, OK, I really need to tighten up my backup system. And also, again, I was at work. It was kind of a nuisance trying to restore the laptop. I was only a few miles away from my house. And of course, there's the other problem, which is now our laptops carry so much of our important data with us. Uh, and sometimes it's unique, and it's the only copy that we have. So, like in, in the case of that um, laptop that I dd I had code on there that I hadn't um, synced anywhere. So it got me to thinking, I really need to work through this problem and figure out what I'm going to do. My first concern was backups. And secondly was, you know, again, if I'm traveling, what would I do about this? So I came up with some goals. Um, you know, I want some reliable, fast backups. I want it to be easy to access and restore while I'm traveling. Uh, I want to be able to synchronize my home dir with my other systems. <laughs> Uh, I want to use as many tools that are available in base or from the packages. I don't want any proprietary tools. And then I don't want to compromise on security. So one of the, uh, so in other words, I don't want to be able to SSH into my uh, firewall or my servers with a password. I still want to be able to use uh, uh, IDs to uh, connect. So you know, I set a, a fairly aggressive set of goals for myself. So which leads to the next question, well, what is a disaster? Well, for me, it's just anything that keeps you from using my computer. When we're, really, I mean, when we're doing disaster recovery at the office, you know, you're thinking about the enterprise, um, disasters can, um, you can have different definitions. Uh, the department I work at, at uh, my company, we know for a fact that if we can't function for several weeks, the company will still make money. I work in internal audit. 
Nobody cares whether we can actually. <laughs> Matter of fact, it would not be a disaster to anybody else's uh, opinion if we fell off the face of the earth. <laughs> Some of the common disasters we face as travelers, hardware failure, that's obvious, you know, just drive, um, dies. Theft, new one, confiscation, crossing borders, um, particular borders just south of us. Um, and then, of course, user mistakes, right? Um, somebody playing with DD when they should know better. Okay, so for disaster recovery planning, this is obviously uh, this is going to be very similar to what you go through in the enterprise, but I'm thinking much more about myself here. So I asked myself some questions, and these are questions you can ask yourselves. Who am I? You know, for some people, uh, maybe there's a few people here who are CTOs. We may not have any CEOs or CFOs, but who am I? Um, am I a system admin? Am I a developer? Um, or you know, are you Glenn, Glenn Greenwald? You know, there are people who have um, as important data as we as developers have who aren't necessarily developers. I'll be honest though, this system probably isn't um, right for your average journalist, but um, it, it's thinking along the same uh, lines. What sensitive data am I carrying with me? Do I have the company source code with me? Do I have access codes? Do I have customer data? You shouldn't have customer data on your laptop, but it does happen, right? When I'm, I'm consulting, my goal is always that if there's an incident, my name isn't attached to it. That's my chief goal if I've got source code is, uh, it was leaked and this consultant in Houston is at fault. What access do I have that someone might want? Uh, am I an admin or root somewhere? Do I have my personal or my employer banking details? Uh, social media accounts, of course, um, depending on who you are again, that stuff can be very lucrative and very um, valuable. VPN credential. Anybody know how Target was compromised uh, for their uh, POS system? It was through an HVAC vendor who had a VPN access into the system, lost um, control of the uh, credentials, and that's how the uh, malefactors got in, was through um, VPN credentials. Um, if you want to know some of the worst uh, offenders of this, lawyers. They've got an immense amount of information about their clients, and they have some of the worst security on earth. Do you have the commitment to an interesting project? Think about that. Yeah, Tom. They also draft legislation, so usually they exempt themselves from their legislation that we have to follow. Fair enough, yes. <laughs> but um, you know, think about all of the projects that you may be a member of where someone can slide a little malware into a project that you ship. So how um, is that hardware or that sensitive data um, at, um, at risk? Well, obviously, thieves and fraudsters, most thieves who steal your laptops are probably much more interested in their value just as what can I hawk them for, right? Um, competitors may be a little bit of espionage, depending, again, who you are. Nation states may be interested in you. The place I work at, we are a target of nation states. It's something we have to consider. Of course, they don't let me use my OpenBSD laptop there. They give me a dumb terminal uh, that's portable. Manufacturing issues again, and then myself. Uh, I've never done this one. I've never left my uh, plane on uh, laptop on the uh, plane. I have left some really nice noise canceling headphones, though. So, you know, what are the risks? So, I came up with my answers. I'm a developer. I carry mostly personal data. Uh, because again, my employer doesn't let me carry it on my personal laptop, but in consulting jobs in the past, I have wound up carrying large swaths of the uh, source code with me. I do have root access to my own servers. If you're at my SMTPD tutorial, I maintain my own mail servers and some for friends and family. I have my social media accounts. I, I am subject to um, you know, thieves and fraudsters of various kinds. I get um, the occasional email that someone claims they've hacked me, and of course they want me to send them Bitcoin. Maybe competitors, and then of course my own mistakes, um, and then hardware failures. So with these um, you know, answers in mind, I began looking how best to prepare for the inevitable disaster. It's not if, it is when. It's just what will the when be and where will you be when it happens. So I started with a little bit of uh, system hardening. Uh, the BIOS uh, on most uh, modern laptops has a few features you might um, consider looking at. Uh, the Lenovo's I know have uh, bottom cover tampering, uh, you know, open um, indications. It'll um, throw a, sometimes it'll make you type in the password or it'll give you an error and just tell you that someone has had the bottom of the laptop off. 
And presumably, if they've had the bottom of the laptop off, that maybe means they took the, uh, the drive out or inserted something. Honestly, it's not something I'm too awful worried about, but it's something to think about, again, depending on who you are and where you are in life. Supervisor password, definitely worth putting in to keep people from getting into the BIOS. And then setting the system to boot only the OS drive. If I need to boot uh, a thumb drive, it's not that painful to type a real quick password. And again, now that we've got Sys upgrade, uh, it's all seamless as far as upgrading my system. I don't need a thumb drive for that at all. This almost goes without saying, but um, full disk encryption really is the heart and soul of uh, any kind of disaster uh, recovery planning because that hardware is going to wind up somewhere and you'd like to know that at least someone isn't going to be able to get into it. But it also gives you uh, reduced anxiety uh, about throwing out old hard drives. Although I will tell you, so we were helping my dad clean out his house and over probably 25 years he had a box of around 30 hard drives. So we took him to a place that does uh, shredding. If you've never seen hard drives shredded, it's, it's definitely worth seeing. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing of beauty. A little um, hardening of the OS, um, the little things to keep people from getting in. If you're not using allow users in your SSHD config, you might think about that. Uh, you know, who should really be SSHing into your systems? Uh, I have um, all of my um, editable config files are actually maintained in a separate directory and I use RDIS to lay them in place. That way, um, again, if I overwrite uh, the root partition doing something stupid, I have, so I actually make all the edits there and then I put them in place with RDIS. This um, gets a little wing nutty. Uh, my laptop hibernates every morning. Um, so as part of my come in, that way I know that the laptop every 24 hours is locked uh, with uh, full disk encryption. And then this one you might find a, a tad odd. Um, you insert an HID, uh, uh, HID device into my laptop and it auto locks. So you might be thinking, okay, um, how much of that uh, tinfoil hat Kool-Aid have you been drinking? But, but there's a reason for that. Whenever there's a disaster, everybody thinks about the first question, how do we recover? But how many times are you actually thinking about what happened to that hardware? I live in Houston. Our, our major disaster concern is flooding. So for the most part, I'm not too awful worried about that hardware. I used to live in Oklahoma. Disaster meant finding the server in the next county. So, you know, due to tornadoes. So, um, you know, what, you know, again, if someone steals my laptop, I leave it on a plane, my luggage gets um, stolen, I want to know how tightly locked down my laptop is. Does anybody know how DPR lost his laptop when the FBI arrested him? Does anybody know the story behind this? This is what got me thinking about why do we trust HID um, insertion. He's sitting, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts, um, Silk Road. So he's sitting in a library and the FBI sent in a, um, a couple who were pretending to be married and they start having a tip there in public. And so he looks away from his laptop and someone reaches over and slides his laptop down um, the table to someone who's waiting. And the first thing that happens is they stick a mouse jiggler into a USB port. And so now uh, they've got uh, the computer unlocked and they've got a mouse doing this every second or so to keep the screensaver from kicking in. So it got me to thinking about that. So, you know, I really don't want people inserting USB devices in my laptop. I certainly don't want them sticking mouse jigglers in there. So uh, I wrote it. If you're wondering how I did this on OpenBSD, hot plug D, it's your friend. I've got a script if you're interested. But also think about the, the other side about this, um, failing safely. You, you still want family to be able to get into the laptop, right? So you need to figure out a way of making sure um, you know, your significant other, uh, mom, dad, children, whomever, can still get into your gear if something um, traumatic happens to you. We had a family issue not long ago where that became a question. Fortunately, um, I'm the off-site uh, cloud storage for the family, and so I had access to what was necessary to get into uh, the various accounts. But it could have gone south if, if things had been uh, locked down just a little more tightly. Fortunately, the laptop in question was Windows, so it wasn't an issue. <laughs> Okay, so I've got the laptop um, hardened uh, at the BIOS level in the OS. So I started looking at synchronization. So repeat after me, synchronization is not a backup strategy. Uh, it can be a part of a backup strategy. And no, snapshots are not a backup strategy if they're only on the device where you're doing the snapshot. So think about that. 
But syncing is still really helpful. Um, you know, one, if you've got laptops or computers all over the world that you need to keep uh, you know, same home dirt. But also, after disaster recovery, you're probably not backing up every five minutes or so. Uh, synchronization can help with that. The tool I chose is Unison. Uh, this, this is kind of a pearl talk. There's more than one way to do it. Pick your own solution. But I like Unison. I trust it. Um, OCaml looks like Haskell, and so I can actually fiddle with the code when I want to. Um, so I have a script set up that uh, runs it every five minutes or so. I've got a server back at the house. Um, it uh, synchronizes my home dirt. Uh, one of my strategies for making sure everything can talk was to use certificate signing. So I use SSH keygen. I generate a cert. All of uh, my servers um, have a uh, ca.pub in the SSH dir. Uh, if you're not using certificate signing, I would definitely look at this. All of my SSH keys are signed um, every 30 days. Yes, it's a nuisance. But again, I know that every 30 days, uh, my personal key expires and I just re-sign it. And then I used SSH um, config to ensure I can get to the server at my house. I don't want to put the server on the firewall. I don't want to pipe a connection through the firewall to the server. So I used um, proxy jump. Anybody know what proxy jump is? I know the OpenBSD folks do. Yes. Anybody who's read, who's read Michael Lucas's book on SSH mastery probably does. This is proxy jump. This is absolutely brilliant. The minus capital J. It will proxy you through as many hosts as you put on the command line and ultimately drop you at the final post. So this is how you can easily get through the firewall. If you, um, when we get to the backup, I'll talk about how I use that as well. But it enables you to, um, so my firewall literally only has one open port, SSH. This is what my SSH config looks like. I, um, inside my house, I run something like a split horizon DNS. I have hosts that are not published. So I was trying to figure out how to, uh, in the house, have the same script work. And it occurred to me, the matched host, key, uh, host directive is brilliant at this. So I have it check. If it can't find a host called FW, then it uses the static IP, which of course I've taken out of here for my own purposes. But if it does get resolution, then it can just use it um, uh, directly. And I do the same thing for my uh, NAS server. Uh, exact same thing, except that you notice it uses proxy jump. Uh, it goes in as a particular named user uh, who's not allowed to have a uh, interactive session on the firewall, so it just pops them straight through. I could have left it as my ID, but um, some of these scripts um, run as both both root and as me, and I wanted one um, way to go through consistently. I'll pause for a second. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, and, and there will be scripts and a few blog posts following up on this where you can see the dirty details. OK, so for backups, uh, again, synchronization and snapshots are not the same as backup. Did anybody, uh, so Wired wrote you know, a, a typical Wired article, excruciatingly long, but they did a, uh, a deep dive into the effect of NotPetya on Maersk. And if you've not read this, it is a it is a tale to read. I've got a link at the uh, at the end of the uh, slides. So, in a nutshell, uh, Maersk had uh, they they were hit by NotPetya because it jumped um, uh, inside the Ukraine, hit one of their shipping offices, and then within hours just blitzed the entire network. And uh, one of the things that it took out was uh, their do domain controllers. Uh, according to the article, Maersk had about 150 domain controllers. Guess how many backups they had? Zero. And the reason why was they had 150 replicas. Why would you need a backup of a domain controller when you've got 150 replicas? Well, because of things like NotPetya. They weren't thinking about that. The only way they actually recovered the domain was, uh, fortunately for them, their Nigeria office had crappy internet and was offline when NotPetya <laughs> slammed through the network. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I heard about that. That was their backup. So they called Nigeria and they said, are you back online? They said, no, stay that way. <laughs> Grab the hard disk and fly straight here to London because they'd set up a command and control center in London. The guy says, I don't have a passport, I don't have a visa to go to London. They said, well, where, do you, where can you fly? He says, well, I can go to Egypt. So OK. 
So they call Egypt, they find a guy who has a visa to come to the UK. So they literally carry this hard drive. This is the ultimate sneaker net. <laughs> so they carry it to um, Egypt, pick it up in Egypt, bring it to London. Now the article wasn't, uh, didn't say anything about this. My first thought was, did you all image the hard disk or did you literally carry the only copy on Earth <laughs> on two sets of airplanes over multiple bodies of water? <laughs> Who knows? It's a great story. I would definitely, just to see what NotPetya did and how it ripped through, and it wasn't just Maersk who were affected, but they were probably the um, single largest bit of collateral damage there. So for backups, I chose rsync. Again, there's more than one way to do it. You could use Borg backup, you can use rdiff. Pick a solution. I like um, rsync because I understand it. And uh, I, I made this decision before this happened, but now we have open rsync and based on uh, OpenBSD. So uh, I don't even have to do package add at this point. Again, I have a custom script. It backs up my home dir. It backs up root, bar, uh, user source, user ports, and user send Okara. Those are the only things I care about because with that right there, I can rebuild my entire system and anything I've been working on. Again, I use the same entries from SSH config, and I use the same signing certificate, except this time the script runs as root. And I need it to run as root because root has access to everything. I could have tried it with a um, backup operator, but that really only works if you're using dump. Uh, so I um, decided to go with um, you know, having root um, do it. But then again, it uses that same proxy account that has no privileges anywhere. Then when it hits the server inside the house, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, the way it um, connects, it um, starts up rsyncd. rsync doesn't even run full time on that server. When it um, connects to the server, it starts rsyncd and then starts dumping the files. So everything is, is constrained as narrowly as possible. All of my servers do this exact same thing. This is again why I chose to use rdist, because I can set up files. Does everybody know what rdist is? Some of the free folks may not know it because it's not in your base anymore. Um, so rdist is the, the old school way of doing Puppet. So you, um, you create your files and you, and you run rdist and then it starts up rdistd on the uh, remote lo location and dumps all the files. Now some of you may be wondering, well, how do you accomplish that? Because you need rdistd to be running as root. Again, ssh config and ssh um, d config are your friend because I can um, one of the things you can do is have, um, there's a minus P parameter on uh, rdisk. So I have rdisk minus P do as rdisk D on the remote box, and then it um, was able to run as root, dumps all the files in place. Um, and, you know, I'll put some blog posts up when I have some time to finish writing them out. And then um, for travel, so I have a little um, NVMe drive here. Uh, from an old Mac that I stuck in this thing. I have an APMD script that most of the time works. Right now I, I turned it off. If I plug this in, it uses uh, bioctal minus C, uh, capital C minus L device minus F. Uh, so it, it finds the, um, the DUID that matches and that's where the password is and so I get unattended backup. As soon as I plug this thing in, it, um, it reassembles the, uh, the, uh, the crypto, mounts it somewhere, R syncs everything to this, uh, unmounts it, and then um, deletes it from bioctal, and I can then unplug it as soon as I see the, the blue light stop flashing. So I um, can get encrypted backups to this without having to type the password every time um, I, I want to do a backup. So uh, you may be wondering, well, doesn't that mean you have passwords sitting on your hard disk in the clear? Yes, yes I do. I've got them all over the place. I still use NetRC. Um, but I use full disk encryption. I keep my computers locked down as tightly as possible. And frankly, if someone's got that level of access, if they can look in ETC, SSL, and start looking at files, I've really got much bigger problems than the fact that they found a crypto password. Okay, so how about some disaster recovery? How do I deal with this um, on the road? It would require some preparation. You can, um, it is possible to do it post hoc. I did it at my office, you know, when I did the you know, the scan FFS, but depending on the disaster, it may not be possible. Again, if you lose your laptop or someone steals it, there's not a whole lot of recovery to be done. If you don't have backups somewhere on Earth, you're, you're really um, toast. 
I, I've thought about doing full, um, so right now it requires me to have a, a couple of things, at least uh, a boot drive that has OpenBSD, a version of OpenBSD current on it. I also have, um, as I mentioned um, down here, um, I have the necessary <laughs> firmware on here because my laptop uses IWM and that's not, um, I also have to have a, an encrypted copy of my SSH key on here. In theory, I could put a server somewhere that has all of that off of HTTP and then I could download that, but I haven't gone that far, and it's not something I'm too awful worried about. If I've lost everything, okay, well, I'm going on vacation at that point. I'll just wait till I get home. <laughs> so the recovery steps are actually um, pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I tested this recently. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, let's say that I DD um, SD0. Um, I can you know, stick this in here, reboot the computer. I know the supervisor password. Obviously, for this whole system to work, I have to have a few memorized passwords. I have to know my supervisor password. I have to know the decrypt um, password to get back to my SSH key. And I have to actually know the password for the, uh, this guy. I could store it all in one text file and maybe encrypt it. But you know, I, I can memorize three passwords. I'm capable of that. Uh, so um, install OpenBSD. Um, Use rsync or, or open rsync and restore my files. Again, now that we've got sys upgrade, uh, I don't even have to worry about this being particularly current. Um, I, it just needs to be fairly current, and then I can let sys upgrade do all the dirty work for me. And then lastly, run Unison to catch all of the um, changes that happen between. So I back up every four hours. Uh, it's, it's um, actually it's 1600. I actually think a backup um, has kicked off. Uh, the, the Unison stuff's going all the time, just every five minutes, boom, boom. So every, um, so while I'm sitting here, I'm, uh, I'm backing up. So does it work? Yeah. I decided to give myself a challenge. I had to travel. So I live in Houston. I had to go to Tulsa, which is about 500 miles away. Um, so I decided to see if this stuff really works. And, and this was a real test, because if I got to Tulsa and could not get everything working, I could not earn money. So. Yeah, there, there, there was definitely some, you know, put, put, putting everything on the line. So I, I grabbed a, a, a laptop that only had Windows on it and uh, these two items and rebuilt my laptop and had it up and running in almost no time. Uh, I, the full, if, if I hadn't had uh, the, the backup of the, of the entire, uh, this disk with the whole backup, it would have taken a lot longer because I would have had to R-sync everything from the house. But by having just this with me. In fact, the other nice thing about having a backup with me is I could do a subset restore. Maybe I don't want everything. Maybe I've got 20 minutes to get to a meeting, so I could just do uh, a restore of just my home dirt, for example. But I was able to get everything restored, came back home, uh, the laptop had um, OpenBSD running on it, and everything was great. And I think I spent 10 days in Tulsa at that time. So it, it was definitely a, a real test, and there was, um, you know, there was something on the line there. So one of the things, as I mentioned, one of the risks that we face nowadays as travelers is confiscation. As, as a US citizen, I'm not particularly worried about it um, inside my inside, but um, you know, there is the theoretical possibility. And so it's one of the things we have to think about. So um, if you fly into the UK, there's an obligation to hand over passwords if they ask. Um, so it's something seriously to think about. How do I protect these things? Well, with your phone, I, I use iPhones. Um, I can actually just erase the iPhone in the air. Uh, um, if, I, if they asked me for the password, I'd have to hand it over. But of course, I could change the password while I'm in the air and just nuke the phone. But I was always a little worried about my laptop. But now that I've got this system in place, I've got, I'm really not afraid to run that command right there. I, I did toy with the idea of doing this 20 minutes before the talk, just to, just to show you all of But, you know, hey, we would have gotten to beer a lot easier, a lot earlier. You could do it at the party. I could do it at the party. Yeah. One of the other things um, I, I could consider doing is carrying the Windows Restore Media for this laptop with me. Turn it back into a Windows box while I'm still over um, international waters, for example. I, I land, they look at the laptop, it's running Windows, it's got nothing interesting on it. You know, no, you know, no one's the wiser. So it's, a, it's definitely a real possibility uh, to 
be able to honestly say, that's my laptop and that's all that has on it. That, that would be my goal is not to have to lie. I, don't, I recommend that you do not lie to people who can put you in jail. <laughs> but, but I actually can say, and if, if worse came to worse, I, can, you know, I, I could nuke the backup as well because I know that at home I've got a backup. That's why I've kind of thought about this zero restore possibility. Could I put everything on a web server somewhere so that if I could borrow a laptop long enough to create um, this, uh, you know, the OpenBSD install, install media and download my SSH key and decrypt it, I could actually do an in-place restore almost anywhere on Earth where I have internet access. There are some other options. If, if DDing SD0 scares you just a little, and it should, um, one of the things I recommend people think about is why am I carrying so much you know, really valuable information with me? Do you really need your taxes from 1974 on your laptop? Probably not. Uh, do you need this year's current financial records when you're traveling? Uh, you know, one of the things you can do, it, it, it actually works, is SSHFS. You know, for those moments when you really, really need access to something that's you know, back at uh, you know, the home um, server, you could SSH through and uh, just mount it long enough to do. I've actually thought about doing that with certain things like all the EPUBs I carry. I have no idea why I'm carrying this many EPUBs, things that I just don't need access to on a regular basis. And of course, um, passwords. Do you really need to have every password or is it sufficient to carry just enough passwords um, to get back to the server? A lot of people don't know this, um, but if you're not using KeePass XC, the new version of KeePass, I'd recommend it uh, for a couple of reasons. One. XC added, um, uh, they, uh, they're working on it more actively. Two, they've added a plugin for Chrome and Firefox so that it'll enter your user IDs and passwords for you. The Chrome one works a lot better, although I've had trouble getting it consistently to work under um, Pledge and Unveil. I think it's just because I haven't figured out the exact right path for the um, socket. Uh, the Mozilla, uh, the one for Firefox just doesn't work, which isn't any surprise there at all. Um, that's fairly consistent with them right now. But uh, the other thing KeePass XC has now is a command line uh, that can read uh, the uh, file format. So you could SSH into your server to get the, uh, those passwords that you need right now in this moment and carry a subset of passwords with you while you're traveling. Of course, the other option is you could get a Chromebook, just travel with a dumb terminal or get Windows and with group policy and it's about the same thing. Okay, so you know, do you have any questions about the, um, uh, the setup? Kind of, like I said, I'm throwing a lot at you. There's a lot of config stuff that I kind of elided over. So, what do you use parsing D at the server? Just out of curiosity, why do you do that rather than just from an out of sync process the other end that it dies? You don't have to bring up the demon, you don't have to Right, and, and you can do that. I, um, I'm currently using rsync D because um, I can use modules with it. And I, I like using um, modules. Um, you know, so rsync you can have named um, paths like um, you know backup or something like that. Uh, so that's really the only reason I would um, consider doing that. Yeah, Tom. What you're saying, like you're using some like you said, like a dumb terminal, like like what remote desktop protocol would you be using or what? Well, um, obviously, if you're on some sort of a Nix-based um, system, VNC is pretty much your only, the only game in town. Um, although, I, I think, isn't there a port of RDP for um, uh, for Linux boxes? JP, did you have some thought on that? No? I mean, I'd love to see a really good port of RDP. RDP is a great protocol. Um, but um, so typically, VNC, mostly for me, remote um, terminaling is just a terminal. That's all I'm really interested in. JP. So, uh, synchronization <laughs> backups, yeah, okay, acknowledged. Um, so you need some way on the remote side of saying, this client machine which wants to perform backups, if compromised, cannot wipe their backups from the, from the remote machine. Uh, is your other remote machine an OpenBSD box? No. The thing that you're backing up to? It's a free now box. Okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, that's the other reason to, um, that uh, you might consider um, rsync uh, running as a, in daemon mode because you can set write only. So you can um, push data into a um, rsync module, but you can't read it back. 
and you can do vice versa. You can have read only as well. I would not recommend running rsyncd on the uh, on a firewall. The the, the security in rsyncd is atrocious. Just just say no. That's why you want to go through SSH always and start uh, the process on the other end. Yeah, Dan. Uh, there is also something called rrsync, which you can put into the SSH .SSH authorized keys file, which restricts you to only running the rsync command. Yes. For, for, for the, sorry, for the yeah, no, it's good. Uh, actually, one of the other things I um, have is, let me see. Something that's included in the previous report. I think it's going to come with all the other uh, packages as well. Um, yeah, where is it? I can't remember which um, one of these directories it's in. One of the other things you should, uh, it's not in that one, you should consider is in your SSHD config, you can also specify that certain users can only run certain commands. That's why I did for that proxy um, user. Uh, and uh, for other users, they're only allowed to execute. Matter of fact, it forces them to execute this particular command. And if it's something like uh, rsync or rdist, you could actually um, indicate that they can't have an interactive terminal because the, it's the only thing that launches. And it's ch, you can see it through to right. a particular place in the tree, and they can't copy anything, they can't right. access anything outside of that ch root. Yeah. We use that in production. And also, we have a different user to add to Right. That's one of the comments was that you can pass in um, uh, parameters to rsync. I thought so. Patrick, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, for the non terminal laptop thing. It doesn't work super well on the BSDs, but I find SSHFS can, all, can be pretty. Uh, SSH what? SSHFS. And okay, yeah. SS, uh, views over SSH. Right, yeah. And actually, it's not perfect. But it's passable. It's passable. On, on a LAN, it's actually not bad at all. You can't, uh, we're talking about for the people listening at home, SSHFS. On a LAN, SSHFS is actually usable over um, a hotel Wi Fi connection. Uh, I'd rather just SCP thing. That's, uh, I'll either use SCP or use rsync to pull things back. Uh, SSHFS. The nice thing about SSHFS is, in theory, it does local caching. Uh, I haven't noticed it being particularly helpful, but I didn't dig in deep to see whether there was some misconfiguration on my part. Uh, I'm at all for that type of application. Uh, upspin? Yeah. Possibly. Um, I'm not, I haven't used it, so I don't really know much about upspin. Looking at it, there's, uh, you go on a YouTube and you do a search for Rob Mike Upspin, he does a talk, and one of his old clones. And it's, the intended application is somewhat similar to this as far as providing the backing store is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, it does, you know, I have the rest of the blue view up, but it, it sounds like you can layer that on top of that thing as one way as well, sort of avoiding the SSH issue. Yeah. And it, it'll give you the cache and things like that. Uh, I've yeah. looked at it, I haven't had a chance to try it out. Yeah, I'd recommend anybody who's going to build a system like this, uh, you know, look at the tools that, that work best for you. Uh, like, um, now, I'll get more of my stuff posted so you can um, crib and recreate this. And I should say, even though I'm talking a lot about OpenBSD, as far as I know, everything that I've done should work on almost any other platform. Uh, you know, Windows may be accepted. That would be a little harder. Uh, but at least on any of the um, POSIX-based systems, it shouldn't be an issue. I thought I saw an, uh, yeah, Philip. Um, Terminal, uh, just thinking about uh, not the WMM, just download the VM image. Right. Like and then nuke it when you don't need it. Yeah, so um, Philip is saying download a VM, use a VM image on a plain Jane laptop and then nuke it um, in situations in which you're concerned and then just re-download it again. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I've toyed with, and I didn't get very far with this because I really need to uh, read the source code, is backing up the um, FDE portion of, a, um, of an SD and then overriding it with zeros and storing that somewhere on a server so that the, uh, the full disk encryption is still in place. What I haven't quite figured out yet is exactly how long it is. I need to figure out how to calculate the offsets correctly. I've got a heuristic that works, and I've tested it a couple of times, but I don't want to tell anybody how to do this just in case I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't want people nuking their um, full disk encryption uh, password and then finding out that I, I miscalculated a bit. Um, Say again? Not in the manifest, I thought we had a document where. Maybe it is now, but um, 
I remember looking for it. I didn't see anything specific on how to calculate it, but it, uh, that, that's uh, so um, on um, on FreeNAS. One of the things they tell you is how to back up your your Gelly keys in in the FAQ, although they hide it from you. It's it ought to be one of those things where you just push a button, download my Gelly keys for me. Uh, but yeah. did you describe what the backup medium is that you carry around with you? Yeah. So this is a um, uh, so I replaced a hard drive inside of a Mac uh, back when Macs were still replaceable. So this is basically, I think, an NVMe 2 drive. So it's USB 3, so it's reasonably fast. I've tried backing up to USB 3 thumb drives. These things have horrific performance, no matter how much money you pay. Uh, so don't pay a lot of money for these things. But these are actually quite passable. Uh, you know, I get excellent throughput. What particular brand and how much? Well, um, so, the, so the NVMe came out of a Mac. This little case came with the um, conversion kit, but these little cases are about 20 bucks. So if you bought like a, um, uh, a Samsung, um, what is it what they call it, the 3D NAND drives, the uh, Micro Center near my house sells them for about, a, uh, I think a one terabyte for about a, anywhere from 150 to 200 bucks, depending on what's on sale. And if you go with the off-brand, the Micro Center brand, I don't think you all in Canada have Micro Center, but for those of us in the US, um, you can get um, knockoff brands that are cheap enough that um, for 100 bucks or less, you can get half a terabyte. So a one terabyte NVMe drive for only about 150 bucks. Yeah. And it's USB 3. Uh, well, you'd have to, um, that's for the raw thing. You'd have to get a case of maybe yeah. another 20 bucks. The case, yeah, okay. So for 200 bucks or less, yeah, you could easily get uh, one terabyte of USB 3 storage that's portable. Now, mine's only 128. I try and keep my laptop fairly slim, so I, I don't carry that much crap, and the crap I don't care. So like, again, all those EPUBs and whatnot, I think I actually have an exclude rule that makes sure that all the PDFs, so I store all the PDFs and EPUBs in one location, because I really don't care because they're back on the server. Um, yeah? Kind of going with that last question. Uh, I'd like to recreate this secure system. Do you have a secure guide that you can follow? The intention was to have been to, was to have written one, but family life um, inserted itself uh, in the past few weeks, so they didn't get written. Um, a little bit on contact details. Um, it'll show up on my blog. Um, I, I don't do any kind of. There's no um, Google Analytics on there, so I'm not trying to push you all to read my blog. There's no advertising. But that, if I'm going to post anything, that's where you'll find it. And same thing. Uh, I'll, pro I'll announce it on Twitter and BSD Network as things start appearing. Uh, and are ready to read. Um, other things, so a little bit of thanks. You know, if, uh, BSD can uh, for hosting us. You know, for, you know, flying us all in and um, providing this this great opportunity. For me, obviously, as an Open BSD user, a uh, big thanks to all the Open BSD developers who make this possible. Uh, a lot of this wouldn't be possible without Open SSH. As a matter of fact, I don't think any of this would be possible without Open SSH. So. If you find an open SSH developer standing around by, uh, by him a beer. Anyone here? Any open SSH folks? But if you run into Damian Miller somewhere by him a beer, he probably uh, would appreciate it. Uh, rsync uh, and open rsync and then Unison, since those are the key tools I use. Uh, and then again, you know, support your, your local BSD. As a BSD user, open BSD user, I suggest the Open BSD Foundation. And then uh, the slides will be on the BSD CAN website shortly. Um, I've got a couple of links to some of these articles that I discussed as we're going through. And then just some ideas of some utilities you might look at uh, that might be alternatives. Sync thing is actually the most interesting syncing utility to me other than Unison because uh, it runs all the time and it's supposed to be doing um, event-driven <laughs> syncing. I don't know if, if it actually uh, is event-driven everywhere. But that would be really nice. Unison has um, the feature, but it requires, um, I, I need to write some scripts and you know, have to tie into the file system. So it's a lot more work than I'm willing to go through when I can cron tab every five minutes and make it happen. For, um, for people who want, don't have a server at the house, you might look at Tarsnap for this. I don't know how fast it would be to get all your data back out of Tarsnap. I've never tested it, but it would, you know, if you're looking for a cloud storage um, option, it's certainly something worth looking at. It's encrypted, uh, so it'd definitely be a, uh, a, a tool to consider. I like having everything you know, under my complete 100% control. So I chose uh, my own servers. 
that's all I've got. So unless you all got more questions, I, I think we're okay. Oh, hey. What would you consider to be the minimal amount of things you need to to recover? Uh, prepare. If you, don't, if you don't have those, and you create just you have like a, a thirty-two meg SD card. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. So what would I need? What's the minimum tools I would need to create a, re, a restore? Uh, honestly, if I, I'd have to have access to something with the internet, because I've got to be able to get files down from uh, the CDN for OpenBSD. But really, I could probably get away with just an encrypted copy of my SSH key and firmware. And then if I've got access to a laptop I can download, I think I could do it all uh, in... The, the, the hardest part would be getting the firmware on for the next boot. Um, that's why I have a prepared key. I just have the firmware ready there for, for myself. I could carry actually a, a very, uh, a, an already supported Wi-Fi dongle with me. That would be another option. Patrick. Mm. Uh, have you ever tried using one of those uh, key disks? Like uh, Nitro? Or yeah, actually, I forgot to mention. So this is the one I use. It's called Only Key. This thing's brilliant because, uh, one, it takes a pin to actually unlock it. As soon as you stick it into the computer, it powers up, and you have to type uh, a five to ten digit um, code into it before it'll even unlock. It has, I think, 24 slots. I can't remember if it's 12 slots in two segments or 24 slots. Um, I don't remember how it works, but it has... Um, you have to have two pin um, codes. One pin takes you to a set of slots that can be very you know, friendly that you could show um, people that wanted to look at your slots. And then you can have another pin code that takes you to some other slots. So you could, I could actually have my SSH key on here because it can type um, quite a bit of data. Um, it, it can also do, um, uh, it does HOTP, it does, uh, it, it is YubiKey compatible. This thing's brilliant. It was about 50 bucks. But with this, I actually might be able to get almost everything done if I could get it to fit into all the slots. So that, that's a, another possibility. I forgot to mention the only key. So um, maybe, just maybe, a laptop, a borrowed USB drive, and this, and I could probably restore everything. Could you fit that amount of data onto a piece of paper? Print it out. Ooh, yeah. Um, how big is an SSH key when it's um, um, ASCII encoded? That, that, that's really what you're, you know. Yeah, just base 64 or 85 or whatever. An exercise for later uh, to see, you know, could I get it down to you know, that? Maybe get it as a tattoo, right? <laughs> you know? I got where, where am I? How long are you going to change your feet? I'll get Pamela to do a, a, a tattoo for me in, in art. I'll, I'll pay her every so often when I want to change my key. Yes, Dan. My use case for, for sync thing is I have two laptops and one yeah. server. They're all running the sync thing. So I only need one of the two laptops on at a time right. to get the data transferred. What, how, what are you doing? As far as um, bootstrapping? Or using, how do you use sync thing? I don't use sync thing at all. I was just recommending that as a possibility. I looked at Sync thing. Uh, it worked um, quite well on OpenBSD. Yeah. What I found was, is on iOS, it was horrible. So I was like, well, if I can't use it um, there. So uh, I, I have a Mac sitting on my desk that can connect to iCloud, and I can actually sync things into iCloud out of my normal directory um, so that they can be available on my phone. But I decided that's really way too much work. And so my iPhone is almost a, a dumb terminal at this point. I use it all the time to sync my phone, and, and the, the pictures on my phone with my... But you have Android, right? Android with... Uh, yeah. Apple. Sync thing on Android is, is brilliant. On iOS, not so much. Yeah. At least the last time I looked. Yeah, and I looked within the past six months. It, yeah. Uh, there's just no effort or, or love being paid uh, to the platform, which is kind of surprising given that almost... I, I, there are people who would pay money for a good sync thing uh, utility, and that's what Mac users do, right? Is they pay money for all their utilities, so you can make money with it. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? <coughs> uh, I don't know what time we're going to be thrown out of here, but well, you got of time. so um, I'm willing to answer questions about this whole thing, or we can go drink beer. Uh, yeah, you're using. Um, well, you mentioned open architecture on this slide. 
did you actually try it or did you just pull I've, it off? I've used it for restoring because, um, you know, for, for pulling off of here, but I haven't tried, I haven't tried replacing it yet for pushing all the way through to the server. I, I want to do some testing with it first. I trust Chrisop, but I want to verify. <laughs> well, while we're having as far as we can, it's not feature complete, of course. And yeah. I think one of the things, does it lack exclude at the moment? Yes. yes. That's what I thought. Nobody can actually figure out what the semantics are. Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons why I like Rdisk. Rdisk is brilliant. It doesn't have the rolling checksums and all that stuff, but it has a beautiful configuration file. It's almost like a make file. And it's absolutely brilliant. If you're not using Rdisk for pushing um, things like config and whatnot, and you don't need all of the um, overhead that comes with, say, a Puppet or a Chef or something like that, if you really, so all of my servers in the cloud, I, I can update them from this laptop. I can also lock myself out from this laptop. I've done that once or twice. But um, it, it just takes a little bit of practice. But I've gotten it to the point where, um, well, fortunately, I use Vulture for hosting, so it's real easy to log in and, and fix those kinds of things. But um, you know, if, if you're looking for a lightweight way of uh, managing configuration, I would seriously look at Rdisk. I don't, I don't know if it's available in the packages um, for FreeBSD. It is? OK. Yeah, you know, there's two versions. So it's yeah. hard to six of the original BSD, and the two twins of the same class sometimes collide. Yeah. So you've got to get the right one. Yeah. Uh, I think OpenBSD is still an artist. Uh, we use the artist 6 protocol. Um, but uh, seriously, I, mean, I've, I thought about using artist for this whole thing, but now that we've got OpenRSync in base, it's just a function of time. Um, until I can completely switch over to that. So for restores, it wouldn't be a problem because I've already eliminated all the things that I don't want. And so it would be fairly safe. But for the pushing, uh, I have a lot of excludes. Um, in particular, um, sockets. Uh, I don't know if it, how hard or easy it is at the moment to exclude sockets from open uh, rsync. Um, curiously, GNU PG slaps sockets inside your home directory. Don't ask me. Well, what I'm even doing with uh, my excludes, uh, there's, um, so in dash A, there's the option to copy all the things. Right. But if you look at the one flag that actually brings in, one of them is copy sockets. So if you leave that out, it stops copying sockets. It okay. It goes over there. Yeah. My tendency is um, rsync minus A, capital H, um, and then B, whether I, if I want um, verbose or not. But it's usually minus A, capital H. Uh, that's uh, my typical, and then a few excludes. Uh, to make it, um, I, I can show you all what the, um, the the script looks like. It's kind of ugly because it has to do a lot of things. Um, I mean, it's, the code itself is clean, but it's just a lot of action going on in there. Um, so it'll allow me to do two things. It can rsync to remote, it can back up to a remote host, or it can back up to a local drive. Yeah, JP. Does your system preserve pipelines? Um, yes. Well, assuming that um, the, you know the file system supports it, but since I'm always going to FFS too, it's not a problem. And then on the remote server, it does as well. So it it, it should be. I, I've never actually really tested it, but I I believe it does. And that's all I need is belief, right? <laughs> um, so it does a couple of things here. It checks um, you know to make sure things are uh, are good to go. But for the most part, the uh, the dirty work is just down here at the very bottom. It just iterates over um, a bunch of directories and then calls that sync function and um, just dumps it all in, in, in the right place. And this runs, like I said, about every four hours or so. And um, same thing for my um, uh, Unison uh, script. I have one. Yeah, Len. So, not specifically about this process, but open our sync. I'm still confused about A, why? Well, the, the A is very simple. Um, uh, part of the BGP protocol requires it. So there's your A, uh, because there was, uh, I don't want to speak for the developers, but I think the answer was something like this. There's no way in hell rsync is going into base. That might have been approximately the answer. But um, open rsync um, solves that problem. And then the B, the compatibility is a function of what Christophs wants to accomplish. I would guess. Um, so, does anybody want to add to that why Open Rsync was written? And I think I some earlier and licensing was a big deal. That, that's, that was my assumption is that licensing was the issue. 
Um, so this is the, um, the Unison um, script. Um, it basically does the same thing. It sets up a, um, uh, you know, make sure that it find the off sock, and then uh, does, um, the thing about the Unison script is it has to be mutually exclusive. Is if it's running on cron tap every five minutes, there's a theoretical possibility of a sync taking one too, uh, too long. Um, for those of you who are going to run Unison, do not run it in cron tap by itself because it does not do mutual exclusion and it will run as many versions. That is the easiest way to screw up your syncing with Unison is to run more than one instance simultaneously because Unison. Um, tries to do it atomic copies and so it will create all these subdirectories uh, with date and time stamps and it wants to control putting them into place at the right moment and the right time. And then you run another Unison which then tries to copy those control files and it, it gets real ugly real fast. So if you're going to run it in cron you definitely want to have um, some sort of a mutual exclusion um, set up which is exactly what my script accomplishes. This, I'll get all this stuff up as, as soon as possible because it's written and I'm fairly confident that it's uh, mostly trustworthy. <laughs> Trust me? What? Trust me? Trust me, yes. And, and you get what you pay for. Does FreeBSD, sure, does OpenBSD not have something like FreeBSD block app? Uh oh, what happened there? That often happens near the end. Yeah, oh well. I, I guess that's, oh, yeah. Darn. The last talk I was in, none of the power bricks, or none of the power things on the table were, right. and I forgot to power again. Down. So yes, I, I just powered down really hard and fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I may actually get to do a demo of restoring later. <laughs>